many social engineering attacks manifest themselves either in the browser, so for example we saw some phishing pages earlier on in the course, or in the email client. And the obvious example there being that many social engineering attacks come via phishing emails. So the email client is one of the first exposures that victims have. Now when we talk about these two channels, the browser and email clients, we have explicit defenses, and we'll go through some of those in a moment, and we have implicit defenses, which we'll also go through, but they are somewhat different. So let me give you some examples. When we talk about an explicit defense, we're talking about how the browser or email client is able to act on our behalf and block the risk before it gets to the user. So for example, the ability to block malicious files, that's something that can be done electronically via software. Warnings around things like deceptive sites as well. I'm going to give you an example of exactly what this looks like in just a moment. But this is the sort of thing that software can do very well. Over on the implicit defenses side of things, we're talking about the humans having to be a little bit more proactive. So an example of this is junk or spam filtering. Now this does sort of fall into both categories, because clearly an email client will automatically flag a whole bunch of mail as being junk or spam. But it's an implicit defense in the context of humans still needing to review what's in there. As good a job as I find Microsoft does filtering spam, I do still find it picks up legitimate mail and puts it in my junk folder. So I still need to make a judgment decision on those individual emails. And the vast majority of it is junk or spam or phishing mails or things that I don't want to respond to. But it's a little bit implicit in that I've still got to make some decisions. Another really good example of an implicit defense is the ability to inspect certificates on websites. So for example, we looked at a number of phishing pages where the domain was a little bit suspicious. In some cases, they were actually very cleverly disguised domains. Now once you can actually inspect the certificate within the browser as to whether or not this is a legitimate site. So there are a few different things to look at, both explicit and implicit. Let's go and have a look at some really good examples in the browser. This is a great example, Chrome's great big red screen. And what I love about this screen is that there is no mistaking it. There is something very, very clearly wrong when you see this. One of the criticisms of security warnings is that people do become a little bit numb to them. They see so many, they just accept them and move on. But Chrome in particular has done a really good job of these warnings because it's very rare to get a false positive and there is absolutely no mistaking that something serious is wrong. Now in this case, it's warning of a deceptive site. And if we look at the URL there in the address bar, we can see that it adheres to this pattern we saw a couple of times earlier on. And that is, there's a subdomain, which is paypal.com, and if you only read that far, you'd look at it and say, hey, that's quite legitimate. But then when you read the rest of that domain name, it's clearly got nothing to do with PayPal at all. The other thing I really like about how Google does this warning in Chrome is that if you do actually want to proceed, there's no clear obvious button here. You actually need to click on details, which will present you with another couple of paragraphs of text. And embedded within that text is the link that then allows you to visit the unsafe site. So it doesn't just present an easily identifiable button. And in fact, in many ways, it's a user experience anti-pattern because it makes it hard to find what to do next, which is precisely the point. Google really doesn't want you proceeding to this site. So you're very much obligated to read and understand the text before you can do anything. Another really good example is when a malicious file is downloaded. And what we can see in this case is Chrome using my antivirus software to identify what's been downloaded is actually a virus. Now this is a great proactive measure, and as much as in modern times we're finding antivirus is not recognizing many of the risks that are out there, certainly when it does identify one such as we see here, it's great that that's blocked explicitly. So again, explicitly being that the software is working for you. It's not implicit 
in that you as the user need to make the value decision. That's particularly important when we consider that most users of browsers are not especially technically savvy. Moving on to email clients, here's a really good example of how Outlook has proactively, explicitly blocked an unsafe attachment. And in this case, we can see that someone has tried to send me a JAR file, so a Java file, which inevitably has malicious content. This again, like in the browser examples, is a really good explicit defense. This has already been blocked. It didn't take me to look at it and decide whether it was safe or not. Now that's a really good example of an email client running on my machine. Let's look at another email example. So here's a good example of email that's gone to junk. And clearly this matches all the patterns of what we would expect junk mail to be. So the point here is that first of all, it has been filed away outside my normal inbox, which is good. But second of all, Microsoft Smart Screen has blocked images from loading because one of the things that spammers and scammers alike like to do is embed images in HTML emails that have unique tracking codes in the source. So if I was to open this email and it loaded all the images, it would be possible to track whether or not I was a legitimate recipient, which would then provide the social engineer or the spammer as it may be, some assurance that they were actually sending to a real person. So this is another really good example of an explicit defense. It gets automatically blocked and I have to actually go and hit that wait it's safe in order to unblock it. Now again, that would be a judgment decision on my part. So the humans are still able to get themselves into trouble. But by virtue of smart screen picking this up, that should serve as a warning sign to them. So they're just a few examples of how we get defenses in both the browser and email client. And certainly other good email clients and browsers do similar things as do a number of good security products. Let's now move on and take a look at something a little bit different, and that's record destruction.